And so we've seen continuous time bifurcations, there are classic examples, a couple of instantiations of it. What happens in discrete time? Well, in discrete time, things are mostly the same, mostly. Let's review. Let's summarize the normal forms for what we have seen. What do we have? We have a saddle node bifurcation, and then we had a transcritical bifurcation, and then we had a pitchfork bifurcation, but those come in two variants, the supercritical and the subcritical pitchfork. Okay, and we have the normal forms for all of those, which really, it would be a good idea to memorize those, really. That would be a very good idea. Now, notice that all of these normal forms are really the lowest order terms in a Taylor expansion about mu equals zero and x equals zero. You have the leading order term that has a mu in it. And that leading order term determines everything as long as mu is not zero. But when mu is zero, then everything is determined by the next term in the Taylor expansion, which for saddle node and transcritical is quadratic in x. For pitchforks, it's cubic in x. Now, each and every one of these bifurcations has a discrete time version to it. To get the normal forms for those, what we're going to do is we're going to take the continuous time differentiation operator D and replace it with the discrete time differentiation operator delta, that forward difference. So for a saddle node, the normal form is delta x equals mu plus cx squared. For a transcritical, it's delta x equals mu x plus cx squared. For pitchforks, it's delta x equals mu x plus cx cubed, and these will split into super and subcritical based on whether c is negative or positive, respectively. Now, in practice, we don't use the forward difference operator delta. We use the shift operator e because it's much easier to do things like stability criteria, etc. So we can convert all of these into using the shift operator. So for example, the saddle node bifurcation in discrete time looks like ex equals one plus mu plus cx squared. This again is gonna have a bifurcation at x equals zero and mu equals zero. And that goes down the list. Now, what do these bifurcations look like? Well, unfortunately, in discrete time, we cannot represent things in the x versus mu diagram like we did in continuous time. So what we're going to have to do is imagine what is happening and maybe look at the discrete time diagrams that we have used in earlier chapters and just look at a one parameter family of these. Look at a, a video of what is happening over time. So in a saddle node bifurcation, what you have is that on one side of the bifurcation, there are no equilibria. You just bounce away. And then as you pass through the bifurcation, a pair of stable and unstable equilibria are born and emerge from that bifurcation point. That's the kind of thing that you can see in a visual representation. What happens in a transcritical bifurcation? There you have a pair of equilibria one stable, one unstable, and they collide into each other and exchange stabilities. They pass through each other and swap stabilities. Pitchforks are really interesting. That's where you go from one to three. In the supercritical case, you start off with a stable equilibrium that as you pass through the bifurcation, emits a pair of stable equilibria while it itself changes from stable to unstable. That's the supercritical variant. The subcritical variant, very similar, but all of the stabilities reversed. So in summary, if you're working in discrete time, you've got the same bifurcations that you have in continuous time, at least as far as what we have seen so far. Remembering the normal forms is very simple if you know them in continuous time. Make sure you understand this in terms of the qualitative changes that are happening in behavior, and you'll be fine.